leadership always comes up as uh, a topic for conversation. And so I've had to, I've had to develop some ideas that um, I've tested some I haven't tested, so I don't know the validity of them. Until you test them, you don't know the validity of them. But what I have determined is that I think of leadership on a hockey team in the same way I think about interviewing for a job, uh, you know, after hockey. If if there is a if there's a job or if there's an opportunity, it, then whoever wants to interview for the job should get a chance to do it. And that means that the job description has to be clear and the measurements and the metrics for success need to be defined because more often than not people are chosen or identified as leaders but they don't know what job they're doing they don't know what success looks like and the opportunity to develop them in a leadership role is missed mostly because clarity is lacking so I've determined that my philosophy of leadership boils down to influence. If you want to be a great leader, you better be someone who can influence another person. And that means that you have to know exactly what the standards are that the team is trying to uphold. And then when that leader functions and upholds those standards, they need to be heard, acknowledged and understood. And when they lack that, when they lacked or missed an opportunity to uphold the standard, then they need to be um, corrected and or uh, empowered and or trained and or. But if you don't have a structure for them to uh, have clarity around, it's pretty hard to know who your leaders are just by feel and just by sense. And in the hockey teams that I've collaborated with, I see that there's there's ice like on ice leaders, and they're usually the best, the most skilled players on the team that get. But there's also very there's another form of leadership, especially at the youth level, and that is the kids that are really like good with other people, and they may not be the better, more skilled players, but they're actually really good in the locker room, and you need them. Uh, on the team in order to uh, create cohesion. So I worked with a high school program one time in the States and I said, uh, I'd like to share with you an idea for how to choose your captains. And coach said, okay, what's your idea? I said, create a job description, post it like you would if you were in the real world. And anyone who wants to interview for it, tell them when the interview times are and tell them that they need to interview for it in front of their teammates. They need to come and tell their teammates why they should be given the job of captain or leader or however they're defining it. And then let the team have some say as to who they thought interviewed the best. Don't, it's not, your coach has the final say, but the team is the one who's gonna be led by these people. So if they don't have any say, then maybe the one that they would have been led by was missed and they didn't have a say in it. And so then there's, there's a missed opportunity there. Uh, so those are some some thoughts I have mostly about clarity, specificity, accountability, training, and under, understanding at least at the youth level, leadership boiling down to the capacity to influence. And the more skills that they have in being able to influence, I think the better leaders, at least at the beginning, they become. Do you have a copy of a job description? For a uh, group? I have one probably somewhere in my files that I could pull up. Well, I think it's an excellent idea. If you can share it with me. Um, I like the idea. I'm just not sure I'm looking. I'm looking to see. Will the players ask questions of the potential captain? Uh, have you ever interviewed more than everybody, else, you know, the people that wanted to be leaders at once if it was a group of three or five? Interestingly enough, Wally, the ones that needed co kind of some encouragement to interview were the ones that were the leaders. They were the ones that the team had to encourage them to interview because they told the team told them that they thought they were good leaders. And. 
Um, hey, Hal, do you remember Billy Lear? Yeah. He was one of the guys that interviewed. He actually put a speech together for his hockey team that he presented to his team to be a leader. It was one of the most impressive things I'd ever seen. And um, so in answer to your question, Wally, I think that um, I do have a descri job description that I put together a while back that I'd be more than happy to share with you. Thank you. I What I like to do is provide tools. Yeah. Mentoring coaches and any elaboration of what you've talked about. I'm editing this portion of it because I've never heard of it it really makes sense and the fact that some leaders will not stand up and interview because they are in the background and they provide leadership through their behaviors they misread their influence capacity because of the label of leader and they don't understand that they are leaders because they are influential, but they don't see the correlation. So does that mean that you need to have some conversations with them, you know, in regards to that, Sean? I mean, we, you know, we, we did this at, at Providence. Yeah. Also, and every year we seem to do it a little bit differently based on the group of kids that we had. Um, but I think Putting together the job description is, is excellent, but maybe some uh, conversation about the different styles of leadership. Um, the, you know, the the servant leader, the quiet leader, the noisy leader, the on ice leader, the locker room leader, that kind of stuff. The but, tension reliever, those kinds of things. You know, one of the things that's so interesting about all of this, and and I always tell our players. We're going to go through this process and, you know, you may never go through it again in the rest of your life. In your working career, most companies don't do this kind of stuff, you know, and so this is going to be, you're going to look back 10 years from now and go, all right, now I got a situation here in my day job. I learned something about this plan hockey and uh, from my hockey you know, experience. So anyways. Um, Hal, I just like to. Um, we're having this conversation. We perceive what we're being, we're talking about. Yeah. Thirty to forty-year-old coach. Do they have that perception and an awareness of it to address it? In your experience, Peter, you can mention because that's what you're faced with, given the. What he said about the job description, if this was shared with your coaches, Peter, it might be an idea. Uh, I'm more interested in experiment with this with coaches down the road, not ourselves experiment with it in our unique environments, because we will have more success than most because of our experience. But I'm just thinking the tools that the coach needs are the same as the fundamental tools of playing that an athlete needs. And we're talking leadership that doesn't happen in the real business world. And there's billions of dollars being applied in that regard. Nope. So the that, that's the situation here. The best way to decrease engagement is to increase confusion. <laughs> so if we want greater amounts of engagement with our players on anything, psychologically, physically, mentally, we have to be um, very attentive to the details that increase one's clarity. And like right now, the bit, the question I get asked all the time with every player is, Sean, how do I strengthen my confidence? And certainly there's a competence factor that leads to an increase in confidence. But right now, 
if I had a thousand coaches in front of me and they said, Sean, what's the biggest thing you've learned over 25 years working with thousands of players? It's we as a leadership group that is trying to develop young people to be more engaged and to practice with more intentionality and to be more motivated by we need to be more clear and we need to give more immediate feedback and we need to make the feedback um, in 10 to 15 second increments no longer because the attention span doesn't support feedback that goes any further beyond 10 to 15 seconds. And we're talking players here, not coaches. We're talking coaches and players. So uh, what did you say, Al? Uh, well, yeah, coach, coach attention is pretty short, too. <laughs> exactly. I love it. How much, really? how much have you run into? Because I've always got this feeling that if, if your ego is as big or bigger than you, you're never going to be able to learn. I think once you can put your ego aside and be excited about the fact that you can learn something from everyone in every situation, then you can move on and grow. And that's one of the things I I saw this past season uh, with some youth coaches is they feel like, all right, I'm the head coach. That means I know I should know everything, which is completely not the case. Because some of them, it might be a first year, some of them might be a second year, some they might be moving up to a level that they haven't coached before. Uh, so the ability for them as individuals to sort of check your ego at the door and just be excited and listen to everyone and know that you can learn from everyone is, is so huge. And again, hopefully they learn that and then they can pass that on to their players where you got the kid who you know, only feels like they're successful when they're scoring a goal, Which, right? They're, they're the best, so they got the answer because they're scoring a goal. But what are they doing when they're not scoring a goal? That that kind of, how that all kind of, kind of plays together a bit. Mm -hmm. Tom Boy. Yeah, I, I just, this just reminds me of a, one situation where I didn't do what Sean's saying to do, and, uh, you know, didn't get any player input at all. So, so anyways, it was uh, with the Mount Royal women's team, and we'd we'd done really well either first or second every year. So, anyways, I had this one player that she was she'd scored a couple of goals a year, and I didn't you know think of her as a leader whatsoever. And uh, so, anyways, we she got a concussion and missed a month and we didn't win a game in a month we lost as many games in that month as i'd lost my previous three years we lost nine games in a row which was incredible for us and uh she came back and we started winning again and then in the playoffs she set a record for goals we were using a torpedo and she was a left winger so she was on that side all the time but anyway, she scored 12 goals in the playoffs and we lost in the league final. And I, you know, after I thought, she's the most valuable player on our team. And I think if I would have gone to the players, like you said, and said, who is the, who, who is the leader here? Because I remember one playoff, she had a thing about pulling on the rope and all this kind of stuff. She ran it and I kind of thought, well, why would she be doing that? But Anyways, that's fine. But uh, you know, it's such it's such a good idea what, what you're saying is find out who the players think would be the leader, and uh, you know this kind of thing. And I think that in my coaching, I have had the wrong captain various times. And one of the worst things you can ever do is have the wrong captain, oh. especially if you're coaching uh, girls hockey because you don't go in the room. And they can change the entire room. So, anyways, this is really good stuff. I just want to say, Sean, I'd just like to mention, and I'm really 